Roger, Roger, 595. Roger, Roger, 73. All right. <clears throat> well, here we are again. <laughs> We've got the countdown going. Um, very good. So uh, I'd like to greet all of you and those that are watching us online as well. And I always uh, put some contact information here. If you're watching online, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us an email. We'll probably help you out with materials and handouts and questions. Any questions from this group from last week or any other place? I assume you've all been reviewing and studying and all of, all of those things. We'll be doing the second half of Chapter 8 tonight. So we'll be wrapping that up. And then next week, uh, Gary will be starting Chapter 9. Chapter 9 is a, a large chapter. And then we're approaching the finish line. I think we've got two chapters after that. Safety and propagation. So these are some of the folks that have contributed materials or input to us. I've got a slide coming up here. We've been talking about radioteletype, and there's a German ham in um, that has set up his teletype equipment in the Waynesville Ham Fest, and also we've seen him in Orlando. So I, I grabbed a couple of pictures here just to show you what some of the stuff looks like. It's really amazing. This you'll never find anything that looks this clean, by the way, because they always grease and oil these things. They're usually pretty pretty scrunchy, but the, these are gorgeous. And I've got one here uh, with some sound. I hope it'll work. Yeah. You hear it ticking away in the background. So that's, uh, that's, that's one in operation. Just wanted to show that. So we're going to go back now and uh, pick up the remaining portion of uh, Section 8.2. We got through a lot of it last week. Uh, we got as far as we had planned to get. And uh, tonight we'll finish that up, and then we'll get into amateur TV, which, which is a very interesting area. So starting off uh, with uh, the fact that the FCC does regulate all digital modes. And if it would be helpful to think, especially on the HF bands, if you keep thinking in terms of single sideband channels, there's a lot of things that relate to, to that bandwidth. Um, if, if not, the, the space that a signal can fit into. Uh, if, if not that, then the number of digital channels that would fit in that space, because they're so much narrower. So just about all digital voice modes are regulated. Well, all digital voice modes are regulated as voice emissions. And you've heard of some of these things, D-Star, System Fusion, and so forth. Um, those, those are all examples of digital voice modes. Now, slow scan TV is also regulated as an image mode. Slow scan TV, there's images that come down from the International Space Station. And uh, we've got a whole section that we'll be talking about a little bit later tonight. And then there's fast scan TV. That's um, the traditional analog television from the 1940s and 1950s, but hams are still using it in some of the major cities today. It's not used on HF due to the bandwidth requirements because those channels take up about six megahertz, and a lot of the HF channels aren't even that wide. <laughs> There's that much, not much uh, frequency there, not, not enough available. So uh, these are some of the things that we'll be coming into next. Maximum data rates and bandwidths, of course, are in the rules. And uh, we talked in a previous uh, class, it might have been the tech or the general, that we can't use any secret code. So any digital modes that we use have to be able to be decoded by, by other hands and the FCC. So the secret or private codes. Remember the two exceptions to uh, encoded transmissions? Well, satellite, uh, satellite control and, and model, yeah, model planes, air, aircraft, model aircraft. Those were the two exceptions. 
Oh, that's on here. That was, uh, you, you got to read it and get the answer right. They better have gotten it right. Huh? They better have gotten it right. <laughs> yep. Now, th this is kind of an interesting, the last time, interesting thing, the last time I uh, did this class, uh, I was trying to do a little bit of research on FSK 441, and I was really confused because I couldn't find it in the current uh, suite of protocols. And it turns out that since this um, question pool came out, this mode has actually been obsoleted. <laughs> so the, the, the replacement was uh, MSK 144, came out in 2016. But for the purpose of the exam, you, you need to know this, FSK 441. And it's especially designed for use for meteor scatter. We'll be chatting about that a little bit. And there, I've got a diagram down here. We've got a transmitting signal and a reflected signal. And meteors, uh, sometimes they're as small as a grain of sand, and they'll come entering the U in, into the atmosphere and, and burn up. And one grain of sand can actually create a meteor trail, which is uh, an area of ionized gas as it's burning up. They can be as long as uh, seven miles long. And those little tiny meteors, meteorites, uh, even as small as a piece of sand, can then reflect um, radio signals. So here's a question for you. How many meteors impact the Earth in one day? What do you think? One, ten, a million? Any guesses? Well, it, it's hundreds for sure. It, it's actually... Um, um, got it in my notes here. Hundreds, hundreds of millions, believe, believe it or not. So if you're into meteor scatter, um, you can make contacts just about every day of the year if you're set up to do so. All you need is a beam antenna on, let's say, six meters um, pointed up toward the ionosphere. And uh, with, with luck, you might be able to talk to somebody a long ways away. Now, the people that are into meteor scatter understand how this works. Um, you might get a meteor trail so that you can send out a transmission, but then that path is gone. So the other person might not get back to you for up to half an hour. <laughs> so you've got to be really, because th there has to be a similar path uh, coming the other way. Uh, I've never worked meteor scatter. I don't have a, a beam on six meters. There's other bands it'll work on as well. but. Um, Fascinating mode. Some people make this just a big part of their hobby. And then sometimes we have um, propagate, or not propagation, but um, meteor storms, and the, the path can actually stay open for an extended period of time. So the trail might last from a tenth of a second to ten seconds. And of course, this is the, the new, new version, but you need to know FSK 441, it was especially designed for meteor scatter. Another way that they do meteor scatter is with uh, high-speed CW. There's software that will send CW at 800 to 2,000 words a minute, which just boggles the mind um, as another fast way of getting, getting out. And then, of course, it has to be slowed down on the other end. If any of you could uh, copy CW at 800 words a minute, I'd be pretty impressed. <laughs> That's another way that it's done. And then we'll, we'll talk... I'll talk a little bit about the WSJTX family of modes. And uh, these were all, uh, they got started with uh, Joe Taylor, who's a um, Nobel Prize uh, laureate, um, astrophysicist. And this family of modes includes all of this interesting stuff. Um, JT4, JT9, Whisper, and JT65, of course, is the part that the, the newest mode that a lot of people have been using. It's uh, especially for weak signal conditions. Let me get my pointer turned on here. There we go. And here's a couple of modes that were designed for EME, Earth, Moon, Earth, or Moon Bounce, as it's called, VHF and UHF. And JT65, and this will come up a couple times in the pool questions, JT65 was initially created for, uh, for moon bounce. It's also proved very popular for QRP, low power communications, uh, at HF. So this really uh, became very popular in the handbands. JT9 is a related mode 
that was really specifically designed for the lower frequencies, but it really never caught on. It's still out there and available, but I don't think anybody's using it, or very few. And the big draw is that um, you can run this at very low power levels, or if not power levels, very low signal levels. You can decode signals that are way, way into the noise. And a couple of us have, uh, have uh, played with that rather extensively. I know Kirby, I think you said you're up to 77 confirmed countries with uh, FT8. Yep, that's pretty cool. And then here's a, uh, a web link. And then here we've got a picture of Joe. This is, uh, he was doing a presentation. And I put a link here to this presentation. It's a pretty long presentation. It's about uh, 80 minutes long. But it, it's pretty interesting, interesting if you want to hear from him and how this stuff came about. But he, he had a <clears throat> excuse me, he had a chart in this presentation that I thought was just fascinating. So weak signal, signal to noise limits for single sideband. In order to carry out a, a single sideband transmission or QSO, you need about 10 dB above the noise. For CW which uh, ear and brain, that's what you're <laughs> decoding it with, minus 15. Now notice the difference between minus 15 and plus 10. That's 25 dB. So one watt on single sideband is equivalent to, well, there's about a 250 times difference between these two in terms of power levels. So it's just absolutely amazing what has been done with, with this software. A part of it is because the bandwidth is so much narrower. The wider the bandwidth, the more noise that there is there. So that, that accounts for some of this humongous difference. Uh, and the rest of it is from the sensitivity of the decoder. FT8 is listed as minus 21, which is the, currently the most popular mode. And this slide is about a year old, um, maybe a little more than that. The current version of FT8 will actually go down to minus 24. JT65, which is the moon bounce mode, or where it was really designed to, to be used, that's minus 25, and then a whisper is way down here. That's the most sensitive mode. A lot of people running um, the, the new 630 and 2200 meter bands are using whisper to see where, they, uh, where they're getting out into the world. It's kind of a beacon mode. You, you transmit a signal, and then you go to a, a website uh, when there's received stations all over the world that uh, you can see where you were received. It's been pretty amazing. So to me, it was just fascinating to see the, this relative difference in signal strength. So if, if you're a QRP person, low power, um, let's talk or uh, mention SOTA, Summit's on the Air, where you've got to carry your equipment up, up to a mountaintop to talk. You're not going to be running 1,000 watts on the mountaintop because the batteries would break your back. <laughs> so it, it's low power stuff. So you, you can see the tremendous advantage you have of being able to do CW if, if, you're, if you're running QRP. Big, big difference. So you can make DX contacts with uh, stations that can't even be heard, which, which is amazing. A little bit more on JT65, moon bounce. And this will come up in a, in a pool question. But just a, a little bit of a sidelight here. If uh, okay, the moon at uh, perigee is 18 term times further than mo the most distant Earth surface contact, the Earth is about 24,000 miles in circumference. So um, if, if you were going to go halfway around the world, that would be half that, about 12,500 miles. But the moon is uh, like uh, 36 times further than the furthest point on Earth if you were going to go halfway around. So that, that's a long, long way. But we've got another problem, and that's that there aren't any ham radio operators on the moon. <laughs> So not only do you have to go to the moon, but you've got to come back from it. <laughs> so that, that doubles the distance. So it, it's just absolutely amazing that you can do any moon bounce at all. And it used to be that hams had to have huge dish antennas. They were running uh, max power, at max legal limit. And the JT65 mode and, and its cousins have made it possible to do moon bounce with much more reasonable equipment in your ham station. So that's something that you could do if you'd like. Now there's some characteristics here. I gave you some general background. And then um, 
Apparently the pool committee really liked JT65 because they sprinkled like four or five, six questions in there. So we'll, we'll hit those here, some of them we've touched on. But now you've got it in terms of the actual words in the pool questions. JT65 improves EME, Earth, Moon Earth communications by decoding signals many dB below the noise floor using forward air correction. We've got some slides that talk about forward air co uh, correction coming up. But a very small amount of the digital payload in JT65 actually contains data. It's something like 13 characters. It's a grid square and your call sign <coughs> and a signal strength. And all of the rest of the stuff in the protocol is uh, error correcting, error detecting um, data. That, that's why it works the way it does, why it's so effective. And here's another way of saying the same thing. <coughs> But because there's two questions there, I wanted you to see the words. An advantage of using JT65 coding is the ability to decode signals which have a very low signal to noise ratio. It's similar to this, just different words. And just a fact about it, it uses multi tone audio frequency shift keying, or MFSK, uh, transmitted uh, with audio frequency shift keying. We talked about that, I think, last week, where we were sending tones out over, over the microphone input for audio frequency shift keying uses uh, 64 tones plus a synchronizing tone, which is where the JT65 comes from. And the way the timing works between transmit and receive, you transmit for one minute and then you receive for one minute. It's actually like 53 seconds or something like that, but it's divided up into one minute increments between the switchovers. That's JT65. And those of you that have been using FT8, of course, that's 15 seconds. It's about four times quicker. But that didn't exist when they did the pool questions, so we have to think in terms of JT65. So that takes about four minutes for a for contact. Starts out with a CQ, and then a person answers the CQ, then they exchange signal uh, reports, and then 73 is usually the last closing piece of it. Now, packet modes, um, Pactor and Winmore. Pactor is, is a mode that um, is used mainly on frequencies above the HF bands. It is possible to use it in the HF bands, but Kastler mentioned in his video that with, with fading and noise, it's not nearly as effective as um, you might hope that it would be. But this, this is a mode that allows you to send uh, files over the air such as email or uh, computer files. Stands for packet teletype over radio, PACTOR. And WinMore is Windows messaging over radio. It's the infrastructure that, that PACTOR talks to. They both use uh, some very uh, sophisticated modulation techniques, including error correcting and automatic communications control. And one of the downsides is that the modems or uh, uh, network controllers, TNCs, terminal network controllers, are proprietary. So there's just one company that makes them. So it can be pretty expensive to, to buy one. The Pactor 3, I think, is about uh, 1200 bucks if you wanted to buy one. These were um, very instrumental during the Puerto Rico disaster. Uh, they had calls out to amateurs that were equipped with Pactor that uh, had the time and equipment that could actually go to Puerto Rico and, and set up communications because everything was down there. The cell system was down, the uh, power grid was down, uh, but, but hams could still operate if they were prepared. And here's some miscellaneous uh, pool references related to some of the things we've talked about. And one is that 300 baud is the most common data rate used for HF packet communications. 300 baud is also the FCC limit, which might be why it's the most common rate that, that is used. If you see it at all at, at HF, there's a little bit of it going on there. And then, then here's a question that's a little bit controversial. Kastler commented on that. 300 baud packet provides the fastest throughput under clear communications conditions. And, uh, Dave Kessler commented, well, that never exists. <laughs> so this, this really isn't all that effective. Uh, but under clear conditions and perfect uh, uh, noise conditions, it, it is the fastest. So you'll, you'll see that in a pool question. 
impact tor can be used to transfer binary files on HF. We mentioned that, email or binary files. And then there's a couple of random things here. Uh, MFS K16, and MFS K can mean one of two things. We've seen it as multiple frequency shift keying or minimal frequency shift keying. And uh, they're, they're both actually in, there's Wikipedia articles on both of them, but I've, to me it's more intuitive to think of it as multiple frequency shift keying. Uh, MF, MFSK16, that's 16 audio tones that are being shifted around. And the key that they're looking for is 316 hertz is the typical bandwidth for a properly modulated MF, MFSK16 signal. And you can kind of get a clue. Um, if you think of the, the S as a 3, you, you can kind of see 316 in, in, in both of them here. So that, that may help you. And also notice that it's fairly narrow bandwidth. If a single sideband channel is three kilohertz, this is only 316. So it's, it's small, it takes up very little space. And Windlink and Pactor for that matter, but Windlink does not support keyboard to keyboard operation. With um, a teletype, you type an A on your end and a person on the other end gets an A. Uh, but with Windlink, you're sending complete files. So it's not a keyboard to keyboard kind of mode. A little bit more on HF packet. This is the protocol that's used. This was adop adapted from a communications or a commercial protocol. So AX, that's amateur, X25, basically where it came from or how it was named. Um, and it's the same as used on VHF packet, but limited to 300 baud by the FCC on the HF bands does include error detection. So if an error is detected, they'll ask that the, the packet be retransmitted. If it's not acknowledged, then um, it has to be retried. And there's usually a limit, uh, typically five. So if it tries five times and it can't get through, then it'll, it'll break down the communications channel. We'll have a little, little bit more detail on how this is set up in a minute. So Pactor exists in really four flavors. Uh, Pactor 1 was the first one, and that is not proprietary, but hardly anybody uses it. it it's really old. 2, 3, and 4 are all um, proprietary protocols by just one company, but 4 isn't legal on the ham bands, so that, that's why I've just listed 1, 2, and 3. Maybe it will be in the future. So it, it works well under weak signal and high noise conditions. Um, except on some of the HF bands where there's a lot of noise and, and fading. Supports binary data transfers, we talked about that. It's an automatic repeat request uh, system. So if a packet is missed, it'll ask for it to be resent. We talked about the proprietary modems and the cost. And these work by uh, evaluating the conditions between two of the modems and then adjusting for the speed that it can handle. It's a little bit like the um, the modems that we used in days of old on our computer at home so that we could tie into Yahoo and the various uh, systems. And you'd hear those modems come up and they, they do a funny set of bee boops as they're training. They're saying, how fast can you hear me? How fast can I talk? And then they adjust down so that they can complete the channel. This works the same way. There's a training period, just a few seconds, and then it knows how fast they can send and receive, and then they lock in and then Pactor 3 can exceed 5,000 bits per second. But we know we can only go 300 baud, so we, we've got some uh, data magic going on there like we talked about last week. And then we'll get into the MFSK modes, and the key thing that I wanted to convey here is that there's lots and lots and lots of them. Not very many of them are in use, I don't know if, if people invented these just because they could, or if, if some of these were more optimum for certain band conditions than, than others. I haven't used these modes myself, um, except for uh, FT8, which is an MFSK mode. But these are all sound card modes, meaning that we're sending tones to a single sideband transmitter. We're using multiple tones to increase the data rate. That was like the five fingers, four fingers sort of thing. You can do that with tones. So MFSK16 uses 16, the bandwidth of 316. We'll see that again. Bandwidth of 300 or 63 bits, or a data rate of 63 bits per second. 
and here's a bunch of the other flavors that are, that are out there. So just be aware that there's a lot of them. And here's what one looks like in terms of a spectrum display. Now digital modes um, are generally adversely affected by distortion. So, and the, the biggest cause of that is overdriving the transmitter. So you've got to be really, really careful how you initially set up your, your transmission so that you're not going to overdrive the transmitter. And one way is to watch the automatic, well, let me ask, what, does anybody remember what ALC stands for? Automatic level control, right. And automatic level control is a, a, a feature that's used in transmitters to, that they detect if they're being overdriven. And if they are, the way they fix that is to back down the audio level because on single sideband, the, the more speech level, uh, speech volume, the more power gets put out. So the transmitter will say, okay, I'm approaching my limit uh, and I, I can't, if I go any further, I might burn myself up. So the way I'm going to fix that is to turn down the audio input, the mic, the mic gain. So the trick is to watch, and most transceivers have got a meter on them that's marked ALC and you want to adjust the drive level in the digital mode so that no ALC is indicated. You want perhaps the highest power you can get without uh, having the transmitter control it, cut it back. So that, that's what this means. Don't use any speech pro processing. Speech processing is like emphasizing the treble or emphasizing the bass to make you sound better on sideband. If you do that with digital modes, you'll be distorting the relative frequencies that are being sent and that will impede the ability to decode it. So the suggestion here is to uh, transmit it into a dummy load, listen to, listen to yourself on another receiver, or uh, call up Gary or Dave and say, what, what do I sound like as, as you're making this adjustment? So this will come up in a couple of different flavors in a minute. Digital mode troubleshooting. Okay, what if, uh, what if you're not able to make any contacts? Well, here's some reasons why. User may be on the wrong transmit frequency. That kind of sounds like a no-brainer. User might not have support for the protocol. Or there may be a station that you can't hear using the frequency. We'll, excuse me, we'll see when we get into propagation that sometimes signals will go up into the ionosphere and come back down. You might be able to hear one side of the conversation but not the other side because you're not in, in the propagation path for the second station. That's what that means. So we've got three things here that might result in unsuccessful contacts, which sounds like an all of the above question coming our way. And then some more notes on transmitter, uh, transmit distortion, which I think we've touched on. This is the way you'll see it actually in the pool question. Overmodulation of an audio frequency shift keying signal often is often caused by excessive transmit audio levels. We talked about that. And uh, this is closely related. Overmodulation is indicated by strong ALC action. Audio frequency shift keying excessive input levels are indicated by intermodulation distortion. And you would be able to see that on either a spectrum display or a spectrum analyzer and they'd look like ghost signals off, off to the side of uh, the desired signal. And intermodulation distortion causes your signal to be wider than it needs to be. And then there's one, one technical question here. PSK, phase shift keying, minimum intermodulation distortion should be down 30 dB, or minus 30, uh, which happens to be the smallest value that, that's in the, the uh, answers. And then there's one that's, um, I think Kastler got into this a little bit, and this, this gets pretty um, hairy math-wise, but fortunately we don't need to understand the math. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM, supports high-speed digital modes. And it does that by using subcarriers. Remember we talked about subcarriers when we were talking about frequency division multiplexing, so we can keep audio frequencies separated from each other? Uh, this works a little bit like that in that um, subcarriers are used for passing data and keeps them from interfering with themselves, with each other. Subcarrier frequencies are chosen to avoid inter-symbol interference. We don't want the data crashing into each other. So although our, uh, o, uh, ODFM is complex, it, these are the only two facts that you need to know about it. 
And if you want to read, there, there's whole books written on that. So in your spare time, you can do that. Questions? All right, let's see how well I did here. Which of the following digital modes is especially designed for use for Meteor Scatter? It's B, yep, FSK441. Whisper is in the same family of, uh, of modes or protocols, but th this is the right one for uh, Meteor Scatter. Which of the following digital modes is especially useful for EME? Earth, Moon, Earth, yep, D, JT65, weak signal, weak signal mode. Which of these modes has the fastest data throughput under clear communication conditions? Yep, D is, is uh, the answer that they're looking for yeah. there. Yep, correct. How does JT65 improve EME communications? Yep, decode signals many dB below the noise floor. And it, uh, uh, there's really two pieces to that. It, it's consum consuming very little bandwidth, so there, all of that noise that are, that's outside that bandwidth you don't have to contend with. And secondly, the forward error correction and the, the decoders make it extremely sensitive. What type of modulation is used for JT65 contacts? Okay. Yep, we went by that one kind of quick, but that's what it is. We've got 65 tones involved, and it's shifting them. And it takes about 50 hertz of space. So uh, that, that's amazing because if you've got a three kilohertz single sideband channel, how many times can you fit 50 hertz into that? You could do the math, but it's a whole bunch, <laughs> dozens. What is one advantage of using JT65 coding? B, right, the ability to decode signals, which have very low signal to noise ratio. Like I said, they, they love this subject and they just ask it in all different ways. How is the timing of JT65 contacts organized? You sure it's not B? <laughs> You'd have to be more patient than, than I am if you had to wait a day to make a contact. Alternating transmissions at one minute intervals, not on alternate days. That wouldn't work. Which type of digital mode does not support keyboard to keyboard operation? That was our Winlink friend. All of the others, uh, you, you can absolutely do that. Type a letter, the letter shows up on the other side. Very good. Most common data rate used for HF packet, which is also the FCC limit for HF. That's C, 300 baud. What is the typical bandwidth of a properly modulated MFSK16 signal? It's B, and there's, there's two that have 16 in the answer, but there's one that's very narrow and one that's very wide. So you want the narrow one, 316 hertz, correct. Which of the following HF digital modes can be used to transfer binary files? That was our Pactor friend. Which of the following is a possible reason that attempts to initiate contact with a digital station on a clear frequency are unsuccessful? Right, yep, that was the one where every one of those were a candidate for, for failure. Orthogonal frequency division multiplex technique used for which type of amateur communications? Say again? Yep, high speed digital modes. I don't know if we actually said those words, but I think it's obvious from the, from the answers. What describes OFDM? Yeah, they make you read all the way to the bottom of this one. And remember that on the exam, these probably aren't going to be in the same A, B, C, D order. So this, this might be B when you actually do the exam. So it, as you're practicing, you don't get into the mode of saying, oh, it's the last one, because that, that'll trip you on the test. Which of the following indicates likely overmodulation of an AFSK signal? Exactly. Strong ALC action would be one indicator. 
there are several. Common cause of overmodulation of audio frequency shift keying signals. Excessive transmit audio levels is a, is a real common cause. What parameter might indicate excessively high input levels are causing distortion? See, this is another one where they come at it from four or five different directions. Intermodulation distortion on a spectrum display. You can see ghost signals. What is considered good minimum intermodulation uh, level for an idling PSK signal? Yeah, that's uh, the smallest value that's there. The, the first two are kind of humorous because this is usually in reference to the carrier signal. Uh, so if you're putting out, let's say, 10 watts, and if your um, IMD level were plus 10, that means that your IMD would actually be more power output than your transmitter is putting out. So that <laughs> these are just distractors, but it's kind of funny when you think that they'd even be in the, uh, in the list. OK, spread spectrum. Uh, and if you looked at the Kastler, you probably went away with a headache because he, he went into uh, he went into that in, in some detail. Uh, there's some real good Wikipedia articles. Our uh, our, our book uh, touches on it a little bit, but uh, there aren't very many pool questions, and we'll we'll focus in on those here. A little bit of background and context. There's actually four different kinds of spread spectrum. Only two of them are legal in the ham bands, and those are the two that we'll we'll be talking about here. But the concept is spreading a signal over a very wide bandwidth. Um, we are normally all excited about putting things in a tiny bandwidth, like the digital modes. But spread, spread spectrum does just the opposite. It, it sends it out over a much larger area. You won't see this on HF, by the way, because it does take a lot of space. So because it's uh, spread out, it makes it uh, a lot more difficult to decode if, if you're not set up to decode it. Dilution of the signals across many frequencies makes it sound like noise to a conventional receiver. It may actually be below the noise floor, and I've got a diagram of that coming up. And then here's one that you'll need to know. Signals not using the spread spectrum algorithm are suppressed in the receiver because basically they can't hear them. They don't match the spread encode. They can't be decoded. So here's a little bit more on that. Um, let me actually flip one slide so we can see this better. Um, this would be a narrowband signal. It might, might be a, a digital signal, um, for example, or a single sideband, CW, who knows. But this, and it's very narrow. In contrast with a spread spectrum signal that's spread out across a much wider bandwidth. And this line here represents the noise floor. So the spread spectrum signal may be below the noise, which is one reason that it's uh, virtually impossible to hear on an ordinary receiver, uh, and the reason that it, it doesn't interfere with anything. Um, and it's, it's also a, a reason why uh, high-powered signals right in the middle of the spread set spectrum uh, signal don't really affect it very much, because it, it, it's putting out its signal over this, this broad range. So if you lose a little piece of it, it really doesn't hurt it. Let me flip back again. So if the spreading code or the frequency hopping, there's, there's two flavors we'll talk about. But if, if they're not matched between transmit and receive, um, they, they won't be heard, which made, makes spread spectrum resistant to interference. And many systems can share frequencies by using a different spreading code. And uh, CDMA is an example, code division multi multiple access, which is um, used, used by cellular carriers. So we can actually be occupying the same um, band, the same uh, space for signals, and never hear each other because uh, different algorithms are in use. So the two flavors that we need to worry about are direct sequence and frequency hopping. And there's a pool question dedicated to each one of those. So let, let's see what, what it is that, um, how, how we distinguish between the two. So direct sequence uses a high-speed binary bit stream to shift the phase of the RF carrier. So that's, that's one flavor. And that's generally uh, digital, digital signals being used. And then, of course, the receiver has to reverse the process in order to understand what's being said. 
So direct sequence is the high speed binary bit stream, shifting the phase. And the other one is frequency hopping, and that does just what it sounds like. You're transmitting on one frequency, and then quickly you're going to transmit on another one, and then very quickly after that you're going to transmit it. And because you're jumping all over the place, no, nobody can possibly follow you. But it's really not random frequency hopping because the receiver knows the sequence and, and can grab those as they move around. So the frequency of the transmitted signal is changing very rapidly according to a particular sequence also used by the receiving system. So we've got frequency hopping and direct sequence. The other two, and you can read about these in Wikipedia if you're interested, there's something called time hopping and a chirp spread spectrum. But I won't get into those. I just wanted you to know that there's, there's four different flavors. We only have to worry about two. And here's the Wikipedia article. <clears throat> and here, here's a diagram that shows the two superimposed on one another. The green is frequency hopping. And you can see that there's numbers here. Uh, this is the 23rd time that it's hopped. This is the first time it starts out here, and then it goes to a different one, and, and it seems to be randomly jumping frequencies all over the place. So this is the frequency hopping in green. And then the direct sequence uh, is down here. It's shifting phase all over the place. So here's both signals shown in the same, same space. Then we've got something called mesh networks. Uh, there's actually a book out. The, the way that mesh networks work, um, they're used in the 2.5 gigahertz Wi-Fi band, the same as your telephone or devices in your house, your tablet. Um, and a, par a portion of that 2.4 gigahertz band is one of the ham bands. So we are allowed as amateurs to modify commercial routers. And there's uh, recommended routers. I don't know if it's Linksys or that there's a couple of brands that people have actually written special software for. Um, and you, as a ham, you, you have access to it. And um, you can set up your own mesh network using this equipment. We're limited to 10 watts uh, peak envelope power. But I, I think a, a typical Wi-Fi is uh, like a quarter of a watt or something like that. A Wi-Fi router in your house, you're lucky to be able to cover your whole house with it. Whereas a ham running 10 watts in an outside antenna, perhaps a directional antenna, could cover the better part of a city or, or a whole, whole area. So some hams are, are really into this, and this is something that you can do should you choose to pursue it. So used in the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band, and amateurs use standard wireless routers with, with custom software that's freely available. And there's a book if you want to learn more about it. Now we'll get into error detection and correction. And I want you to feel really, really sorry for this guy over here. What, what, what's his problem? He's missing one piece of the puzzle, and he has no idea what to do. Poor guy. That's a little bit like digital communications in our world. So what good is data if it's corrupted? Well, possibly no good whatsoever. And our friends, uh, Radio Teletype, PSK31, have no error detection or correction. So if you don't understand what's coming your way, you just have to, have to do it over. Adding a parity bit, and we saw this when we were talking about ASCII, can detect single bit errors. Helps a little bit. And then there's something much more sophisticated called um, the cyclic redundancy checker, CRC, that can detect um, lots of errors. And then there's a, a technique called automatic repeat request. You can see where the letters come from here, A-R-Q. Either a, a packet is acknowledged, in other words, I, I heard you, everything is happy, or not acknowledged, which is a NAC, not acknowledged. So that this is a case where the protocol has something built into it to say, um, was it received correctly? And if it wasn't, please send it to me again. <coughs> So maybe that'll help this guy out. We'll see. Oh, look at this. We found the puzzle piece. So with error correction, it's possible to add additional data up front to correct errors. And that's what forward error correction is all about. Uh, the JT modes, some of them use this extensively. 
And the way that that works is that redundant data is sent. So if, um, if you detect that there's an error, you use that redundant data to reconstruct what's missing. If not too much of it is gone, um, you have the chance of rebuilding it. It's implemented by transmitting extra data that may be used to detect, first of all, and if detected, correct the transmission errors. And the reason it's called forward error correction is because it's going out with the outbound signal. You don't have to ask for a resend. You detect it and you fix it based on the redundant data that's, that's in the packet. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, forward error correction codes. You might have heard of some of these. So if this is forward error correction, what would reverse error correction be, do you suppose? Well, reverse error correction says, I've got an error, send it over to send it over again. Yep. So you've got to send it back. That's not in the book, but I thought it was fun. Okay, a little bit more. Data unrecoverable. Uh, or data becomes unrecoverable once the error rate exceeds the correction threshold. So depending upon the forward error, 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 excuse me, forward error correction uh, algorithm, you might be able to connect, uh, fix two or three or four or five errors in the data. Once you exceed whatever that threshold is, then it's, it's shot. You, you, can't, you can't do it. So that would normally break down the connection. And then Kastner mentioned uh, the Viterbi encoding. Um, and very sophisticated math thing. It's just mentioned in our book. There aren't any full questions on it. But the, uh, the diagram that, that Kastler had in his, his video was uh, convinced me that I really didn't want to try to understand how that worked. <laughs> but uh, the point here is that the data uh, de error correction, error, error detection and correction can become extremely sophisticated. And here's a, just a picture of, of how it's, it's formatted. I won't go through all of this, but basically a, a packet is going to have a header, tells, you, tells us where it's going. Then it has the data or the payload of the packet, and then a, a checksum. And a, a, a CRC is just a form of a checksum. So it verifies that the data is correct or not correct. And then if it isn't, uh, it'll provide data to uh, redundant data to help you put it together. Then the automatic repeat request um, will usually send data without a checksum, um, but it does check the data, and if it's incorrect, it'll ask to have it repeated. And that's the concept there. All right, a few more questions. Might get out early again tonight. What type of transmission is most often used for a ham radio mesh network? What kind of transmission? Yep, that's our spread spectrum on the 2.4 gigahertz band. The Wi-Fi band, or part of the Wi-Fi band. What type of equipment is commonly used to implement a ham radio mesh network? Network, how about network? Okay, standard wireless router running custom software. And there's websites that have got all of this stuff on. I'm sure the ARRL has got resources as well. Why are received spread spectrum signals resistant to interference? A lot of, a lot of words to read, but it, it is a signals not using the correct algorithm are su suppressed in the receiver. They'll either sound like noise or you won't hear them at all. What spread, what spread spectrum communications technique uses a high-speed binary bit stream to shift the phase of an RF carrier? Remember, there were two that we talked about. Or there was frequency hopping and direct sequence. Yeah, this is the direct sequence. So there's nothing about frequencies hopping in the, in the question. How does the spread spectrum technique of frequency hopping work? <clears throat> Here, C or D? Well, it's D. The frequency of the transmitted signal is changed, changed very rapidly according to a particular sequence also used by the receiver. 
So frequency hopping, changing frequencies all over the place. The very complex area, but they don't ask us very many difficult questions in the, uh, in the pool. This should be a freebie. We'll see what do the letters FEC mean as they relate to digital operation. Yep, forward error correction. How do we implement forward error correction? C is correct, transmitting extra data, that's the redundant data I was talking about, that may be used to detect and correct transmission errors. First thing we have to do is uh, detect that there's something wrong with it, and then we apply our internal algorithms to try to resolve that with the redundant data that's sent. <clears throat> How does ARQ accomplish error correction? Now, what does ARQ stand for? Automatic repeat request. Yeah. If you can remember what ARQ stands for, then uh, the answer becomes very obvious. ARQ, automatic repeat request. And now we're going to get into amateur television. And this would be an ideal time to take a break. So let's take a five minute break and we'll come back and we're going to get into our way back machine. We're going to go back in history and see where some of this stuff came from. So you can look forward to that during the break and we'll see you in five minutes. All right. Um, now we're going to be getting into amateur TV. And I said we were going to take a ride in, in the Wayback Machine. Right? We're going to get in our time machine and go back in history a little bit. Because uh, there will be two flavors that we're going to talk about in amateur TV. One is called Fast Scan. That uses the standards that uh, commercial broadcast used back uh, that started in the 40s and the 50s and 60s. So when you were home watching TV, the same technical standards that were used in that day are what we use in what's called a fast scan TV and the amateur bands today. Um, not HF though, because it takes up a six megahertz uh, channel and we can't do that on HF. <clears throat> so with that as an overview, there was a committee that began all of this back in 1941 the National Television Systems Committee, which is why it's called NTSC. And then color was added back in 1953. And some of you might go back that far. I, I was born in 52, so that gives you an idea. I, I wasn't aware of very much of this kind of stuff. The color standard was RS-170A. So this, this was television uh, when there was no digital TV. So amateur television, also called fast scan, and that's, that's what appears in the current uh, question pool. So all, all of the digital TV standards, um, they weren't caught up to that uh, level at when, when this book went to press. And that's relatively new in, in ham radio as well. There are some European um, standards that are being applied to amateur radio. We'll comment on those just briefly. They're not included in the pool questions. But digital amateur TV is definitely our, our future. And I included a web link here that talks about the state of the art in, in digital TV. That'll probably be a lot more interesting and, and fun. Um, with fast scan TV, it's kind of a, a, a niche mode. And except in the really big cities around the United States, if you went to the trouble to get set up to do this, you probably wouldn't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> It, unless it was a, a friend of yours that, uh, that was also interested in trying to do this. But there are a bunch of pool questions, so we'll go through how it, how it works and uh, um, what, what's needed. So th when the color standard came out, uh, the FCC was very insistent that when color TV came on the scene, they wanted everybody with black and white TVs to still be able to watch TV. So they had, it had to be backwards compatible. So that, that was built into the standard, and, and we'll have some pictures on how they accomplished that. And Kessler did a really good job of describing this, so um, that'll let us flip through some of this a little quicker than we would have been able to otherwise. 
the European standard, I think is called DVB-T, is that right, Gary? Gary's our broadcast guy, but he's talking right now. Um, but that, that's coming our way. But we, we can use that in the United States, but we won't get into that in, in our presentation tonight. So here's what's involved with uh, setting up a station for fast scan TV. You have to have some kind of a camera and a microphone. They're showing a 70 centimeter uh, transceiver, that's the 440 band, which is the lowest frequency that you can, you can use for this mode. A TV set, and when we say TV set, this is the, an old analog TV. And then a power amplifier and, and an antenna. So that's what you'd need. So you'd need a little bit of special equipment for this to work. The transceiver, of course, would have to be capable of transmitting a six megahertz wide uh, signal so that this would be special equipment. Now, how in the world do they do this? Well, the magic is shown here. What's happening is there's an electron beam that is scanning. This would be like an, a television receiver. So it's, uh, well, it, it would work on transmit too, but we'll talk about receiving. First of all, there'd be a, 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 a scan line here where some video would be applied, and then we would blank that signal retrace back to the beginning, and then draw another line. So line by line, we're slowly building up a video image, rescan and so forth. So we're gonna do that until we get to the bottom of the screen, and then we're gonna jump up here, and we're going to retrace to the top with the beam turned off so you can't see it, and then we're gonna start the, the next scan. So the first one starts out in the middle, the other one starts out on the end, and when we have these two complete fields drawn, we have what's called a frame. So we're gonna, first of all, we're gonna do the odd lines in a 60th of a second, and then we're gonna do the even lines in a 60th of a second, and when you put the two together, you've got a complete picture. So that, that's the technical magic. So sawtooth waves are being used to, to drive this uh, the beam going across the CRT. And here's some of Kessler's stuff. Um, and he's showing scanning one line. He's got a picture of a flower here. Do I have a better picture? Yeah, here the, the flower is, is coming in, into view. That's what we're trying to draw. So let's back up. You can barely see it in the background here. But we're going to scan one line and then we've got a black, these are voltage reference lines, black being low voltage, white being higher voltage. And as we change video intensity, we can see that um, the, the levels and the signals are changing. So this, uh, we're, we're seeing this the variation of video bouncing around. We hit a dark zone, okay, that's gonna swing the voltage low. We get into a light zone, we're swinging the voltage high and so forth across the entire waveform. So this is a representation of the intensities across that line. That's just one line. We're gonna do that 525 times, it turns out, for one picture image. We'll do that 30 times a second. So after we finish one line, then we're gonna go down, if these are odd lines, it's gonna skip a line and go down to the next one and do the same thing. So here's a few more details, same picture. So we're gonna do 262 and a half scans for each field. That adds up to 525 for each frame. Remember, a frame is a complete picture. A field is the odd lines or the even lines. And here we're showing uh, just the odd lines having been scanned. And here we've got the odd lines and the even lines shown side by side. That's a process called interleaving. When all of that is put together, we wind up with the flower. So again, a field is composed of odd numbered scan lines. And here we've got a field composed of even numbered scan lines. And when we put them both together, we get uh, 30 fields per second, or 30 odd plus 30 even, winds up in a scan rate of 30 frames per second. 
we got a complete picture. Odd plus even equals complete picture. <coughs> so the first thing that you might need to know is that the standard used for North American fast scan amateur television is the NTSC standard. Next, there's an interlaced scanning pattern, which is generated by scanning odd and even numbered lines in one field and even numbered lines in the next field. And those two combined make a frame. Here's a picture of a sawtooth. This is the electronic signal that, that's driving the beam across the screen. If you add up all of the scan lines, uh, they total 525 horizontal lines make up a fast scan frame, half in each, the even and the odd. And we have 30 frames uh, to comprise a complete picture per second transmitted in a fast scan system. And then the act of turning off the beam as it's returning to the other side of the screen is called blanking. Blanking turns off the scanning beam while it is traveling from right to left or from bottom to top. So we're just kind of summarizing all the things that we've talked about here in the context of how they'll appear in the pool questions. And again, we've got the picture here, how that's done. And a little bit more detail here. RS-170 is the, is the color standard. And some things have to happen. You might have seen the older TVs where sometimes the picture is flipping, um, either horizontally or, or vertically. In fact, there's a story about that. There's a, there was a television repairman that was working with an older, uh, older lady. And she was very, very particular about how her picture worked. So um, the TV repairman went to the back of the TV and adjusted the, the vertical hold control. That, that's the control that makes the picture not flip horizontally. He said, OK, well, I'm going to show you a whole series of pictures here. And when you see the one you want, tell me, and I'll stop it right there. So I don't know if that worked or not, but uh, <clears throat> that was a neat trick, I thought. So what we have here, in order to uh, ensure that the signals do stay in synchronization. We have, um, the, the, here's, this, here's the video, first of all, let me focus on that. So we've got a white level and we've got a black level. And video engineers talk in terms of IRE. Uh, we, we like to talk in terms of volts. They like to talk in terms of IRE. Um, IRE is the Institute of Radio Engineers, which later became the I, IEEE. But this, this, these were technical standards, and they used IRE levels for, uh, for black and white. So black is shown as minus, or is, is not minus, is shown as 7.5, and white is 100. But there's levels below that. So these sync pulses, um, you might say, are blacker than black. They're completely invisible. So here's the sync pulses before and after. Here's the active video. Here's some numbers, and this should be review by now. Uh, the field rate, the evens and the odds, happens at, at 60 times per second, 60 hertz. The frame rate, the complete pictures, happen at the rate of 30 hertz, 30 times per second. We've got 525 lines per frame, which is half that number per field, the evens and the odds. There's a sound subcarrier that we haven't talked about yet at 4.5 megahertz. The channel bandwidth is 6 megahertz. So there's actually an F, there's a sound carrier here, and the audio for commercial TV uh, actually puts a subcarrier at 4.5 megahertz. That's FM, and that, that's how you can hear sound on your TV. So just, just a review here of uh, some of the numbers we've talked about. Now, in color, you see these numbers are a little bit skewed because of the techniques they had to do to um, fit the color information in. These numbers are, are off by just a little bit. We were seeing 60 and 30 before. Well, it's just slightly off from that. And then there's a, what's called a color subcarrier. It's a reference frequency, 3.5 megahertz, which just happens to be in the 80 meter ham band, by the way. So I don't know if. If, if it's possible to tune that in on a, on a transceiver. Have you ever tried that, Gary? Yeah. Okay, so if you've got a, a, an older 
TV receiver in your house, you'll probably find a, a birdie, a, a signal <laughs> sitting right here. And also, if, if you happen to like that frequency, I'm sure there's thousands of them available on the used market because they were in every TV. And lots of crystals, lots of surplus crystals on that. Exactly right, yep. Sound carrier is the same, channel bandwidth, six megahertz. And kind of a random fact, you'll need to remember a name of the signal component that carries color information is called chroma. And I have a dumb way that I remember that. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, some of you have probably heard of Kodachrome film that back in the 35 millimeter days. Uh, Kodachrome and color go together in my mind. So that, that's how I remember chroma. And here's a channel um, spectrum. Now this is ATV, uh, that's not all-terrain vehicle, that's amateur television. Shows a little bit more here. We've got a luma carrier, a chroma carrier, the elements of color. Yeah, the luminance, or the black and white intensity level, is the same between color and black and white. That's the same. And here's the audio up here on a 4.5 megahertz uh, subcarrier. So that this is how it, how it shows up. This is actually uh, amplitude modulation here. And uh, they cut off the lower part. That, um, and the, the combined signal is called vestigial sideband. So it, it's the upper, the upper portion of, of the AM signal. The lower part is cut off. And then there's a guard band between channels so that you don't get interference between TV channels. So just it's the upper side band that is full and the lower side band is just a vestige of, of the other. Yep. And that Luma carrier is where the AM carrier exists. Okay, so if, if you were putting out a, um, just the carrier itself, that would be right here. So you can see the upper side band piece of it and then the lower side band that's been, been filtered off, the vestigial side band. Here's another picture. Um, there's some terminology that has uh, been around forever. Uh, in one particular uh, line of video, they've, they've got what's called a front porch and a back porch um, wh where the sync pulses are. And then in color, there's a chroma burst that happens right here to help sync up the color information. And then just another picture of the relative frequencies that are involved. A little bit more on, on the way that they transmit. Vestigial sideband, and this is blue, so we're going to see this again. Vestigial sideband is amplitude modulation in which one complete sideband, which is the upper sideband, and a portion of the other are transmitted. The lower part is semi-filtered. An advantage of vestigial sideband used with fast scan TV is that it reduces bandwidth. Um, it's still six megahertz altogether. It's, it's pretty broad while allowing for simple video detector circuitry. And you may remember when we were talking about AM transmitters and receivers, all you need to detect um, the audio in an AM transmitter is just a simple diode. And that, that's kind of what they're getting at here. It's a little bit more sophisticated in TV, but um, uh, that's what they mean by simple video detector signal or circuitry. It's relatively easy to do with, uh, with AM. So here we're showing the lower sideband, the upper sideband, the chroma carrier, or the, uh, uh, which carrier was that, Gary? The Luma carrier is down here, which would be the center frequency of the uh, transmitter. And then the carrier for audio at four and a half megahertz up. Now back to amateur TV a little bit. So we need to have, well, and commercial TV for that matter too, need to have a stable picture even with very weak analog signals. And one way that they do that is they invert the video. So remember, I, I was showing you the sync pulses that were down, the, the blacker than black. If they invert that, then those sync pulses are at the maximum level. And it's real important that things stay in sync. So that, that's why they send it upside down. Video is inverted for transmission, which gives us stable pictures. Excuse me, the peak signal is thus the tip of the sync pulses. Some math here. And in our case, it's only permitted on UHF or above because of the, the, the wide bandwidth of the signal. 
And here's uh, a, a few more terms. Uh, this, this is just background and, and context. Color TV sends luminance, <coughs> black and white part, plus the chrominance, hue and saturation, terms you've probably heard. And all, all of these are uh, coming out on, on the carriers that are assigned with, within the signal bandwidth. Here's another picture of the signaling that, that's going on. This, this would be the black and white case, standard NTSC black and white television. Note that there are 15,750 scan lines per second. That's how, many, how much is going on uh, in the overall picture. And it winds up in a spectrum that looks like a comb. You might have heard of comb filters in TVs. That's what it refers back to. But a black and white TV doesn't do anything with the spaces in between these peaks. So like magic, we can use that for color information. That's coming up here. For color, they use the spaces in between to insert the color information. So again, just a, a high level concept is all we're, we're wanting to get across here. Now, how are we going to transmit audio with the video? And we're talking about amateur TV here. With NTSC, the commercial standard, they use an FM subcarrier at 4.5 megahertz. We saw that. Amateur TV can use any of these and do use any of these. A frequency modulated subcarrier, which is the standard uh, commercial method, or a separate VHF or UHF audio link or frequency modulation of the video carrier. So these are all ways that amateur TV can put audio on with the video. This uh, again sounds like an all of the above question coming our way. We gotta get audio over there so that you can answer this question. Can you hear me now? And just a review of, of the system, TV camera, a transmitter, some means of getting audio power amplifier, and antenna. And then there's one uh, very random <laughs> fact here that, that's gonna come up, common TV or FM ATV frequency. Uh, what we were talking about was taking, uh, with the NTSC standard, was taking a, a six megahertz uh, bandwidth. If we were to do it with frequency modulation rather than amplitude modulation, it gets a lot broader than that. So we can use amateur TV with FM modulation, but only above 1255 megahertz, which in the pool question I think is the, the largest number. But because it's in there, I had to mention it. So some questions. Let's see if we can sort out all of these numbers. How many times per second is a new frame transmitted in fast scan uh, TV? Now we're talking frames. That's 30 times, yep. The frame is the complete picture. How many horizontal lines make up fast scan? C. That was C, 525. Half even, half odd, totaling 525. How is an interlaced scanning pattern generated in fast scan TV? D, by scanning odd numbered lines in one field and even numbered lines in the next. Two fields make up a frame. What is blanking in a video signal? Turning off the scanning beam while it's traveling from right to left or from top to bottom. Uh, be because it's impossible to hit, do that instantaneously, um, that's why they have to blank it. Otherwise, there'd be a little bit of an artifact there that you'd see. Which of the following is an advantage of using vestigial sideband for standard fast scan TV transmission? Why did they use that? Right, vestigial sideband reduces the bandwidth while allowing for simple video detector circuitry. What is vestigial sideband modulation? Right. Yep, if you can remember that it's amplitude modulation, you don't have to read any further. 
amplitude modulation which one complete sideband and a portion of the other are transmitted. What is the name of the signal component that carries color information? That's chroma. Correct. Which of the following is a common method of transmitting uh, accompanying audio? Be careful here, it's amateur fast scan TV. We know how they do it with commercial. Yep, that's the all of these. What is a video standard used by North America fast scan TV stations? That's our NTSC, correct? Which of the following frequencies is the one likely to uh, be used for FM amateur TV? D. And again, remember, it might not be in this order on the test, but it's, it's the highest frequency that, that's listed there. And now we're going to talk about slow scan, which uh, Kessler comments really isn't TV at all, because it's just still images that we are going to be transmitting. Uh, to me, fast scan isn't very exciting because I'm not going to find old TV sets and to be doing six megahertz bandwidth signals. Um, there, there are pull questions on all that, so we need to know it. But it's something that I don't think I'm ever going to do. Um, fast scan, or excuse me, slow scan uh, is the other flavor that we're going to talk about. And that actually I might be interested in doing. I haven't yet, but it fits in the space of a single sideband channel. And um, you can do, use it on HF. And if you're set up for any digital modes currently, you have everything that you need to do slow scan, uh, what they call slow scan TV, which isn't really TV. It's just image transmission. Here's a picture from the International Space Station. And it was uh, copied and by this person here. So it would be a German. It's a link there. So you can get these kinds of images and share them. Some people actually do their station ID by uh, putting a camera on their QSL card. So you could transmit your QSL card with slow scan. Image transmission <coughs> uses sound card based software, single sideband on HF or FM on VHF. Most of our discussion will be about HF context. And because we're going to be using single sideband, um, we're going to be transmitting audio tones. There's a, three or four pull questions that say, how do you do this? How do you do that? And the answer to all of them is audio tones. <laughs> because with single sideband, audio is, is what you're going to be transmitting. So when we get to those, you'll, you'll know in advance what the answer is going to be. All right, image transmission sound card based software, same thing you need for any digital mode. And the approximate bandwidth for slow scan TV is the space of a single sideband channel, which is three kilohertz. And we're going to use varying tone frequencies for brightness, video, and picture new line signals. So everything that we would be, um, all of the control signals and video information signals are going to be audio tones. Now there's no interlace, you send one frame per picture and um, it takes a lot longer. <laughs> it will, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And of course NASA, I showed you a NASA picture uh, earlier from the space shuttle and they also used a slow scan TV during uh, the Apollo program. Probably not on the amateur bands though. And we commented on that. So here's the system. It, it looks a little bit similar to what we saw before, but in this case, we, if we get a video camera, we need to get, use a frame grabber just to take one, uh, one picture of what we're seeing in the video because we can't uh, transmit moving uh, varying audio. It needs to be a still image. So we can get that from a scanner, from a frame grabber, or from, from a camera. Goes into the computer and everything gets converted to some form of audio tones per a given format protocol. And then a sound card, because we're going to take that digital information, convert it to audio tones, and then send it out an HF radio. And this is just like the HF radio you'd use for single sideband. The radio that you have would work. 
So here's a, a few facts and figures about what's happening uh, with, with the math. The frame time is eight seconds. So it, it would take um, eight seconds to compose a complete picture. It can be longer than that if, if you're using a different protocol. Lines per frame is 120. Remember we had 525 before. So there's, excuse me, much less resolution. Some other odds and ends here. That The point is that the, all of these control signals are audio tones. And there's a number of formats. Um, so we've, and here Scotty has shown up again. That was in one of the distractor answers in one of our previous questions. So there's different names of these formats, different times that it takes. Uh, it looks like Scotty takes 110 seconds. You've got to be pretty patient for that one. And these are the number of lines that you transmit. You'll generally see a correlation between the number of lines and how long it takes to send. And this will be important to remember, the 128 and 256 line formats are most often used. And you'll see those here. Yeah, most, most of them are, are qualified. So how are we going to know which format to decode is, is the next question. Somebody's sending a slow scan TV and we want to adjust our software, but we don't know what format. So the answer is here. To identify the SSTV mode, slow scan TV, the vertical interval signaling code is sent as part, uh, sent as part of a transmission it is used to define the mode format. We saw our, our rescan or our blanking going on in commercial TV. Well, they're actually going to be sending some, some data during that equivalent period with slow scan that I, uh, uniquely identifies the code. So that data is read and then your software will know which format to use to decode it. Okay, now uh, that, that was uh, analog. There's another flavor of slow scan TV that's digital based on the, the digital, the, the DRM protocol, digital radio Mondial. And it's also limited to three kilohertz for voice or TV. This is digital images now. And you need no additional hardware beyond your normal equipment, beyond a receiver required to decode DRM on a, on a PC. So this also is something that you could do if you want to play with it. Here's one flavor of software, EasyPal, and uh, I've not played with this, but here's a, a web link for it. And most of the activity is found on, on 20 meters. This is the, the calling frequency, but the, this is usually where they actually uh, put, put the, uh, the signals. Now, in operation, it's important to know that, uh, well, just, just like uh, with FM or other forms of digital, it's a 100% duty cycle mode. So if your transmitter is rated for 100 watts output, uh, but that's intermittent uh, amateur service rating, um, you might need to reduce power to keep from burning up your, your transmitter. So just, just be aware of that. Same thing here, uh, because of all of the relationships between frequencies and, and signals. You don't want any distortion going on, so no ALC or speech processing. No noise blanker or DSP. Everything just wants to be clean. No extra processing. This kind of makes sense. Um, it, it's tricky when you see it in the pool question. Uh, let me read it. Uh, slow scan TV is restricted to the phone band segments of all bands and their bandwidth can be no greater than that of a voice signal of the same modulation type. Um, interpreted, uh, that just means uh, everything has to fit in a single sideband space, three, three kilohertz. And here are the most popular frequencies, 40 and 20 meters. And a station ID via picture is okay. Voice is recommended in case listener is unable to copy. That this is your at the end of the transmission and every 10 minutes you're supposed to ID. Well, the same thing applies with, with video. 
but picture ID is, is allowed by the FCC. Okay, some questions, and then we're going to be out of here for tonight. What hardware other than a receiver with single sideband capability and a suitable computer is needed to decode slow scan TV using DRM? That's the no additional hardware is needed, which means you could do this with, uh, without a, a big investment if you wanted to pursue it. Which of the following is an acceptable bandwidth on the, on the hand bands? And that's, again, the, the space of a voice channel, 3 kilohertz. What is the function of the vertical interval signaling code sent as part of a slow scan TV transmission? Remember, that was the, the data that was being sent, and we're going to decode in order to figure out what? Identify the mode being used, so your software will know how to decode it. How are analog uh, slow scan TV images typically transmitted on the HF bands? One magic word. There's three or four questions like this, and the answer is always tone frequencies. <laughs> But see if that makes sense, or if you agree with it. D. D. Yep. Varying tone frequencies representing the video are transmitted using single sideband. Correct. How many lines? Let's see if we can remember this one. How many lines are commonly used in each frame? Complete picture of a slow scan color television picture, C, that was the 128 or 256, and all those modes that we looked at uh, were 128 or 256, that table we showed you. What aspect of amateur radio slow scan TV, um, slow scan television signal encodes the brightness of the picture? It's our magic word again. Yep. It's all going out over a sideband channel, so pretty much every, every kind of signaling uh, data, um, it, almost any, anything that we need to do has to go as a tone frequency. What, what encodes the brightness of the picture? It's going to be tone frequencies. What signals the slow scan TV receiving equipment to begin a new picture line? Tone frequencies. See, I told you. <laughs> Lots of questions, same answer for all of them. What is the approximate bandwidth of a slow... Oh, the tone frequency isn't in the, in the list of answers. I don't know how we're going to answer this one. Yes, fits in a sideband channel. Say again? Three kilohertz, yep, three kilohertz uh, space. What special operating frequency restrictions are imposed on slow scan TV transmissions? Three. Yep. They have to be restricted to phone band segments uh, because they're, it's three kilohertz wide, and that can only happen in the phone segment. And it can't be any greater than that of a voice. The bandwidth can't be greater than the a voice signal of the same modulation type. And I think. That ends our presentation for tonight. So go home and all the way home as you're driving, say tone frequency, tone frequency, tone frequency, and you'll, you'll get all of these. That's all we have. Do you have any comments for next week, Gary? Uh, antennas, gonna be a good one. It is, yep. There's one. What's that? No, you're doing it in two pieces, right? Two parts, yeah. two parts. yep. And I'll yeah. send an email out with the guy. Yep. Yeah, there's probably not too much more important in all of amateur radio than antennas, so this is going to be a really important chapter.